All right, why don't we get started? Uh, today, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, platform as a service and OpenStack. A lot of the discussions that, that you've been attending, I'm sure, um, and a lot of the, the, the talks at several OpenStack summits really focus on the technology, the processes, the infrastructure around OpenStack. And today, what we're going to do is give you a brief overview of uh, work that we've done with, with one of our customers with regards to uh, platform as a service on top of OpenStack. So what, we're not going to dig down into the technology per se today, but we're really going to be talking about process and how an enterprise actually went ahead and built out an OpenStack cloud and then layered on top of it a platform as a service. Not only the, the, the solution, the technology, but more also the processes, what the changes they needed to make to the organization uh, to really take full advantage of an OpenStack cloud. So first of all, who are we? Uh, my name is Francesco Paola, CEO of a company called Selenia. Uh, we specialize in delivering uh, solutions and services around OpenStack, the OpenStack ecosystem. And today, I'm also going to have uh, my VP of Operations, Seth Fox, walk you through that specific case study. Um, we spent uh, quite a bit of time at uh, cloud scaling. Uh, we delivered services over the last 20 years from client server to e-business, e-commerce, uh, outsourcing, and now cloud for the last four years. Uh, and, and today we'll talk about uh, uh, some of our experiences in terms of delivering not only OpenSec, but also platform as a service on top of that. So very briefly, uh, we're a company that has been around for about two years. Uh, we started the company to help organizations embrace and adopt cloud. Uh, we've been working in the OpenStack ecosystem for uh, four years since its inception. Uh, our CTO, Ken Peppel, is actually one of the first uh, folks that actually contributed to uh, the Bear release. Uh, he built out an OpenStack cloud for his company, Internet, before starting Selenia with myself. Um, we're building some IP around the edges, but really the, the core today that we want to convey to you is our experience in delivering technology solutions and new technology solutions for uh, enterprise organizations and specifically OpenStack clouds uh, with platform as a service layered on top of it. So what, what I'll do first is I'm going to walk you through some very basic uh, OpenStack implementation principles, and again, what we've seen in, in, the, uh, in the enterprise space in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so let's assume that you've decided to implement an OpenStack cloud on-premise. Uh, and really on-premise, uh, typically you drive uh, that, that decision based upon business requirements based upon specifics around workloads, based upon what you want to do from a competitive perspective. Um, so let's assume that the drivers are the typical ones. The first and foremost is agility. Agility has been one of the primary drivers of organizations moving to cloud and specifically OpenStack. Uh, the second uh, driver has been uh, obviously cost savings, although we'll, we'll see later on as to why that is not the first reason organizations are actually moving to cloud. A third is operational efficiency. What cloud gives you, gives you the ability to move much more quickly, gives you the ability to architect solutions that are specific to your needs, uh, that give you the ability of your enterprise to actually move more quickly, and to create standardization across the organization uh, to uh, create repetitive processes and become more responsive to the market. And then finally, uh, the driver around openness. So not, not focusing on uh, an or, uh, uh, technology or solution that, that creates lock-in, but really creating an ecosystem that allows you to s swap and change parts uh, as they come to bear. And as you know, technology changes so quickly these days that you really want to try to remain flexible in bringing in new technologies as they come uh, to bear. But taking these four uh, drivers, uh, really the, the, the main one is agility. Uh, more and more so, uh, we're finding that organizations want to move to the cloud because they want to become more agile, more nimble. They, they want to increase time to market. They want to be able to deliver services to customers much more efficiently. They want to do it in a repetitive manner. Uh, and really, th what cloud, the, the, the infrastructure of cloud and the services and, and processes on top of cloud give you that flexibility to respond to the market. So let's assume also that you've architected the OpenStack cloud, so specifically to support your current and future workloads. Uh, we work with organizations that are looking to deploy uh, services to the cloud, both private and, and hybrid, in some cases public, uh, around media and transcoding. We're working with a customer right now that is looking to deploy services uh, where today they have static infrastructure. The infrastructure is not utilized to its full capacity. They've built an OpenStack cloud solution on-premise, uh, private cloud, and they want to bridge uh, the, the ability to go to an AWS or a Rackspace or another public cloud uh, with, with the ability to deliver uh, faster and better services to their customers. 
Uh, another workloads, uh, workloads that we see that are driving cloud adoption is around big data analytics. Um, and in fact, we've worked with a customer uh, in, in the manufacturing space that has uh, wanted to build a specific requirement around a big data analytics for uh, taking data from their R&D, their quality, uh, their uh, external partners and whatnot, and analyze it and deploy uh, value-added services to its customers. Um, and the reason why I'm walking you through these workloads is because not all OpenStack clouds are the same. Uh, the OpenStack architecture really depends on uh, the workload that you're trying to support. Another example is HPC. We actually work with Cisco and Red Hat on an, uh, with an organization in the U.S. called the Broad Institute, where they uh, sequenced the, the human genome uh, back in, uh, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And now they're, they're opening up their infrastructure, not only for internal consumption, but also for the research uh, institutes to be able to access that infrastructure, their data, their processes, their services. And so really the architecture for HPC was very, very different from what, what we did for a media company and what we did for this manufacturing company. And then there's obviously a proliferation of dev test environments, which is typically where organizations go first uh, in deploying OpenStack clouds to test it out. And there's more and many more that the workloads that actually drive uh, the, um, uh, the decision-making process. So let's assume that you've done your homework and you took our approach and actually the approach that other organizations take, like Marantis and others, that actually help you rapidly deploy OpenStack clouds. And specifically, uh, what we've seen is starting with a proof of concept. Proof of concept allows you to test the technology in your environment. It allows you to test the technology that's integrated into the legacy infrastructure, allows your, your operators and developers to become familiar with the, with the platform. Um, and, and specifically, once you build a proof of concept, you want to be able to measure. You measure to optimize the architecture, to optimize the processes, to tune the infrastructure, and then iterate on that infrastructure and deploy a pilot. And the pilot really here is getting a single rack up and running with production workloads, and you do more measurement, more iteration, until you get to a phase one of a production cloud. Uh, and this process is actually quite important if you're going to embrace OpenStack in your organization to be able to take full advantage of what it can bring you, especially with the innovations around uh, Juno that, that have come out recently um, that are, that are going to be coming out in the next six months. You want to have these test environments, POC, pilot, uh, to be able to test these new components and deploy them rapidly in, the, uh, in your environment. And actually, one great example um, is, is the case study that was published by the OpenStack Foundation around the car cloud, where you can see this process in action and how this organization actually went from POC measuring the performance requirements, measuring the cost, uh, investing in a pilot, and then going out to full production. So let's assume you've done all your homework. Let's assume you've walked through this process um, and you have a productive OpenStack cloud. And specifically, you've got a, 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 an infrastructure that gives you the agility that you need to deliver services much more quickly to your customers, be they internal or external. Um, you've built the architecture and infrastructure specific to the workloads that you're trying to deploy and really, and really architecting the solution to be able to expand and scale beyond the specific workloads that you started with. And you've iterated and measured uh, and deployed and continually deployed uh, the infrastructure. But ultimately, uh, this is only going to get you so far. Ultimately, you want to be able to scale. You want to be able to scale to be able to achieve agility, the agility metrics that you've uh, set yourself out to, to, uh, to, to get. Um, you want to start hitting those cost metrics because ultimately, you can justify the investment in the infrastructure to your executives up to a certain point. But until they start seeing the results from a cost perspective, then the growth and scale of that cloud uh, is going to slow down. So you need to really identify those cost metrics and measure the results. And then finally, you want to hit the operational efficiency targets, and specifically around quality, repeatability, standardization, being able to allow your developers to use code as a service, uh, call data, uh, uh, data uh, stores as a service, et cetera, to be able to really take full advantage of the infrastructure. And so what we see now is taking the OpenStack uh, infrastructure, but in and of itself, the technology is only going to get you so far. And really, when you're building a private cloud uh, within an enterprise, you really need to look at the whole ecosystem. So OpenStack is one component, but ultimately, you're going to have to look at process. How does my procurement process for a server change from uh, the four months that it takes me to get a, a physical piece of hardware in the data center uh, to weeks, to days, to hours? How does the organization have to change in order to be able to take full advantage of this new flexible technology that gives you the agility? So organizationally, in terms of how do you 
break down the barriers between uh, your server team, your network team, your storage team, uh, breaking down the barriers between the development teams and the ops teams. And then finally, looking at the skills, right? Are your skill sets today where they need to be in order to project you into the future and take full advantage of these new technologies? Uh, and we'll get to uh, what, what sits on top of OpenStack in a second. Uh, but in other words, you need to look at the entire life cycle. So today, a lot of organizations are, bro are, are segregated and separated into very specific, discrete uh, units of ownership, and there are gates that you need to pass through, right? There's the business that drives the requirements, comes up with new services for their customers. They hand off the specs to the developers. The developers work in a, in a somewhat of a closed environment without an understanding of what really the market is asking for on a day-to-day -day basis and without an understanding of what the deployment teams and the operations teams have to do to get their applications to market. Um, so we start looking at uh, the layering on of these softer services. So you look at the layering on of agile methodologies. So going from waterfall to agile. So enabling your developers to be more iterative in their approach be more connected to the business units, be more connected to the teams that are going to be deploying the applications, and in some cases, moving some of the development capabilities into the de deployment teams and to the operations team. Then you layer on the DevOps components. So DevOps specifically around tool chain, uh, tool chains and technologies that facilitate the process, the implementation of CI, CD processes, the implementation of uh, the continuous deployment capabilities. Um, and really getting those, those core skill sets ingrained within the development teams and the operations teams to kind of mix and match those capabilities and work hand in hand to facilitate the deployment of these services. But ultimately, there's one piece that's missing. Uh, and we've, we've seen this recently with, with a financial services customer where uh, you talk about driving Agile through the enterprise at the CIO level to get 5,000 development teams, 5,000 developers to move to leverage Agile. You start looking at an independent uh, uh, work stream around DevOps, so bringing in tool chains, bringing in the technologies that allow you to be much more effective at, at driving that. But ultimately, there's really no glue that keeps it, this all together, right? And the glue that we found that actually functions really, really well is platform as a service. Platform as a service here is not really about the technology, right? Because OpenShift and Cloud Foundry and other solutions actually do the job pretty well, depending on the technologies that you have in-house, that you want to migrate from legacy to cloud, that you are building greenfield. Uh, so what, what you really need to do is, the first thing you need to do before you introduce this platform as a service concept, again, not a technology, but a concept and a set of processes, is defining it. So we've actually worked with several customers, and this is a, a summary of what we've seen fits the definition quite well, right? And you can see that platform as a service really is a combination of common shared services, services that can be called upon by developers that are commonly shared across the organization uh, that allow the, the customers, the de developers, to actually be much more effective at, at deploying uh, their applications. You've got platform services that are commonly, commonly uh, accessed. You've got published services where development teams that actually create common services can then publish them and allow other development teams to um, uh, leverage. And there's data services interfaces. In other words, a lot of enterprises have a lot of legacy data, a lot of data stores, a lot of um, uh, information that resides in multiple silos, and you really want to look at building interfaces to be able to extract that information uh, as a service in a pull method for, for the development teams to be able to take advantage of it. And then really, look, OpenStack is one component. It's the component at the bottom. It's the infrastructure that, that actually everything sits on. But if you're really going to take advantage of this, this technology, get the agility that you're looking for, get the cost savings that you're looking for, you really have to look at the whole when it comes to implementing a full platform as a service on top of uh, the infrastructure. And so what actually, what, what, does it, what does this get you, right? It gives you the ability to automate. So automation in terms of being able to uh, call up services as opposed to writing them from scratch every time that a developer needs them. It gives you, the it gives the developer velocity. In other words, they are much more efficient uh, and quick and fast in terms of being able to put applications together and really taking all these components that you're starting to build and deploying in a centralized environment uh, and pull them into the applications and leverage those services uh, in a common manner so that you don't have to re reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, 
You're also setting standards, right? Standards in terms of being able to uh, create repeatability, being able to create um, uh, processes and components that can be used across the organization. Uh, and then finally, giving the developers the control, right? So the ultimate goal of Platform as a Service is to turn and invert uh, the way services are pushed out to developers and turn it around and let the developer actually call those services up when they need them. So now I'm going to turn it over to Seth, and let me introduce this case study in a second. So one of our customers, a Fortune 100 financial services institution, actually has been uh, investing in building out OpenStack for the last 12 months. And what they found is they've developed a strategy to migrate applications to OpenStack, but they found that the development teams were kind of left behind. There was an, there was an agile uh, uh, initiative within the organization to get all the developers to be much more efficient at, at delivering code and applications, uh, but it was segmented and segregated from the OpenStack uh, deployment. Um, and so what they did was it, they said, look, we need a platform as a service strategy, right? Yes, we understand there's a technology component that sits on top of OpenStack, but ultimately we need to understand how do we reconfigure our environment? How do we change the culture in the organization so that developers are incented to use these common services, developers are incented to create standardized services and processes uh, so that we can be much more agile and much more efficient at delivering uh, these services to our customers. And specifically with the competition that exists today with the rate of change of technology, this is a very critical component in being able to uh, uh, respond to market changes, new technology introductions, uh, being able to, to address competitive threats much more readily, whether it's competitive threats coming from your traditional uh, uh, competitors or new entrants in the market. So if you look at this financial services organization, um, the, with the proliferation of payment options, this was a real threat to them. And so what they needed to do is they needed to not only embrace this new technology, but also be able to deliver services on top of their legacy environments uh, and move some of those legacy environments to this agile platform to be able to take full advantage of the opportunity. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Seth, and he's going to walk you through the case study and kind of talk about the business drivers, uh, the infrastructure that we set up, the processes that we looked at, um, and some of the benefits that came out of it. Great. Thank you, Francesco. So what were the business drivers, right? Francesco touched on the first one here, competitive threats. The small company that's going to come and overtake the Fortune 100, it, it, it's happening all the time. And they really need to be able to respond to that and handle those types of environments. And the way their development environments were set up uh, t today, and in the beginning when we started this project, there was no way for them to respond quickly at all. They really could not react to the environment. They had to, and when, when this happens to these big companies, you know, it's extremely frustrating. And that goes to time to market, right? Being able to get those things out and serviced and to their customers very quickly and iterate on them, right? Go through that agile enterprise and, and really make sure that th they're getting what they need to their customer base. You know, service quality and availability. The uptime is obviously very important for a financial institution, so making sure that, you know, they could maintain that as they moved into a platform as a service environment was critical for them as well, so that, th that their brand was not impacted by these types of changes. They need to make sure that in this new technology, they're using OpenStack uh, and a PaaS platform, right, using those environments, that their brand is still there, so their availability and quality is still, is, is still showing through. Uh, reduced cost, I think Francesco touched on it, um, it wasn't a major driver for them. Their goal was, was really the other three, but it was definitely something that they knew was going to come along for it. They, they weren't focused, however, a ton of energy on that because you know, if, you're doing, if you're just doing this to reduce cost, you're not really going to see all the benefits out of this. So by taking this and, and, and literally putting it to the bottom of the list for, for their priorities, I think it gave them a lot of ability to focus on the other areas that they needed to be successful here. So what we did with them is we, we worked out some, some guiding principles, right? If you're going to do this, this is actually a very big shift. They had a very large set of waterfall development process, want to move to Agile. They, they had a ton of outsourcing, a lot of customers, that, a lot of companies that they, they had worked with doing development processes in different ways, and they needed to, to get that in line. So to do that, Agile was a prerequisite, right? We didn't want to embrace waterfall development cycles into this past platform. It was going to be too much of a learning curve for those teams at that point. So we had to, we had to make sure that, that there was a prerequisite. The teams were all migrating to an Agile development cycle, and this really was a prerequisite to get started. Um, inversion of control, Francesco touched upon this. Um, you know, typically in their organization, which we see a lot in a lot of places, is software is pushed over the fence, right? And if you want to use somebody else's software in the enterprise, 
you have to have a meeting, you sit down, you work out what you're going to do, and then you go and you start to consume it. This inversion of control really works the other way. You're not building applications anymore, you're building services that are consumed by developers. Developers can just start using services, and then there's a development environment to set that up. So you have an authentication service, for example, people can really just start using it. So th the stuff doesn't get, need to get rebuilt. You know, what we always see is we don't want to have the meeting, so we're just going to build it ourselves. The inversion of control really eliminates that and makes sure that people can get started doing what they're doing. Um, Developer-centric environment, I think, in, in a lot of uh, a lot of our gen large enterprises, developers aren't sort of the focus, right? I think some of us work in, in, in small companies where developers are really the core. They wanted to be able to take that and create that environment inside this uh, financial services organization so that they could inc entice people to come work for them. You know, we heard stories about people that they couldn't hire because so they, they didn't have this type of, of environment for their developers, so they wanted to create that here. So, and invest in the platform and not the projects. What this is really about is, you know, everyone built their own projects and rebuilt their own services, and they all had their own infrastructure as well. So build this platform up, build this PaaS together, and, and make it an enterprise PaaS, and really not just, you know, it's not this department's PaaS or this project's PaaS. It's really getting that, getting that up and running. To do that, it has to be centrally engineered and centrally managed. So you have one team that's growing that out, and there's a focus to actually build just the paths, team to build that, and we'll talk about that as pe people are c building services to run on top of it. And paths must be prescriptive, right? What this is really talking about is, you know, I inside this, inside this uh, financial services company, every group sort of picked their own tools and their own products. Uh, you know, we're going to use this J2E engine, right? Everyone's got a different version of something that they want to use. Paths, really, you have to get that in line. This is what this is how it's going to work, right? And PaaS eliminates a lot of those barriers so people don't have to make those decisions. But if you have a service to consume, you, you, you tend to make, make different choices, and that was pretty important to, to the success here. Um, and an open community development approach. So when you have, you know, maybe you, you've, you're trying to consume a service and it doesn't have that functionality that you're looking for within the enterprise, take this community approach and maybe you can build it for that team or you put it in their backlog and keep that, that, that process moving forward. So basically take what we've got here in, in the OpenStack community and try to build an internal community of developers. You know, Francesco said 5,000 developers, it's a good size. They can really you know, generate this type of stuff inside, inside their organization. So what were the base platform characteristics? This is kind of an overview. Um, if you look at it, you know, the key thing here, developers generate their specific code, their service code, and infrastructure code. I, you know, the, this concept of infrastructure as code is, is coming through the OpenStack community pretty well, but you know, a lot of large enterprises haven't seen that before. Make sure that you're describing your infrastructure in a way that is maintainable, repeatable, version control, all those things that you need, so that as you move between environments, that'll happen here, you know, stuff is the same everywhere, because you run into problems in, uh, in particular in this case, the differences between each of the environments was, was, was so wide, you know, it would take a long time to go from dev to test to prod and so on. So we, what we created for them was a sandbox environment with common services that I'll talk about in a little bit, but they would be able to play around and learn paths in this environment. And then when they wanted to get into their, into their, full, uh, in their full environments, source control, CI, CD, code review, text fixtures were, test fixtures were all there. They had very specific release gates that they wanted to, to, to go through to do this. Um, some, of them, some of them were human, some of them could be automated. So as you went into the test environments, you know, that was automated, but as you get to production, there needed to be a person to say, yes, this code is ready, we've officially tested it. And the, the release tools were doing this, it was fully automated. The goal is to make this fully automated throughout the life cycle so you don't have the oops as you're putting it into the production environment. Right? And, and to get there, it's about service discovery, SO enablement, um, the community development model, which we talked about, and their focus was open source where possible. They wanted to start consuming as much open source as possible. In this particular case, they weren't as comfortable yet in contributing to open source. They were working on that, but they wanted to definitely consume it and make sure it worked. So how do you get there? We, we, what we, we put together for them was an MVP approach, minimum viable product, get something up, get people using it, and, and get the ball rolling inside the organization. So to do that, we built some base common services, logging, monitoring, single sign-on. So these are things that everybody could come up and consume. These were the, the top three in this organization of things that, that, that they knew all the applications needed uh, extensively, right? So they didn't have to come in and build a logging facility or build a monitoring facility. They used uh, a single sign-on service. So all the applications would sort of have these to start. 
build out a Hello World app that people could come in and clone and start working on, right? You, people have to learn these environments. So put together you know, a WordPress application, a, a three-tier application that does single sign-on and integrates to a logging and monitoring service so they could see how it works. Um, and with that, you could, people would actually come in and extend these services, right? Certificate management, caching, load balancing, these were the priorities for this organization. And you know, you'd go through the different milestones and move it, and, and eventually you'd end up with, a, with the, these scaled applications. People were just adding to the services. You know, they would start in the sandbox, and that same production release that we talked about would actually get them all the way through in, in the production environments. And at that point, your platform is growing. Not applications individually, but the entire platform is growing. So when you're done, you have to measure success, right? This is very important in a lot of large enterprises. We have to know, did this work or didn't it work, and why didn't it work, those types of things. So there were three major categories that we talked about for, for, for them in terms of measuring success, agility, efficiency, and quality. In the agility side, production release velocity was, was a major measurement for them. Their, their production release cycles were very slow. You know, typically, in an agile environment, you're developing, you know, it's kind of a, a coming to a point, right? You, you deploy a lot, and then eventually you, 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 you're stopping. You do one deployment, and that's your production. So getting that release velocity down, the cycle times down, was very important to them. Development environment provisioning time, I think we've probably all seen this. You give a developer needs, needs a set of machines. I've seen this with several of our customers, and it takes six months to get them in the development environment set up. And then they hoard it, right, because they can't get it back, right? So to, to make sure that this provisioning time came down in a PaaS environment, they could come up, push a button, and their development environment would appear, and they could destroy it because they knew they could get it again. So you're not wasting these resources. Those six servers that the developer got and they're hoarding are sitting there doing nothing when they're you know, out of cycle, but with, that, with this, they would actually get a lot more efficiency. I think they estimated 80, they had some like, some like 80% of available resources were idle because, of used resources were actually idle because developers were keeping them because they knew they couldn't get them again. And then PaaS adoption, we wanted to make sure we were measuring the adoption rates. You know, when they're coming on with new services, were they actually choosing the PaaS platform, right? How are they making sure that this is all happening in the, in the right place? So the developer wait cycles was an efficiency task as well, and it kind of goes with the provisioning time. The developers end up waiting when the, when the hardware is being provisioned, and that takes a lot of time. Um, and then dev test defect rate. As you, can, you know, as you go through these things, and your, and your services are actually getting smaller than your bigger applications, your defect rates go down, and that was a great way to measure for them. So in terms of success factors that, that were important to, to this enterprise, you know, developing the technical community, making sure that these people were, were not just good at building applications for them, but they were actually getting better and uh, getting smarter and growing, right? Getting that developer-centric focus. Um, minimize lock-in, it's pretty common. That's why we're all sort of at this OpenStack event, right? We don't want to get stuck on one vendor and really and, and get locked in so we're, we're, we're stuck doing it, things a certain way. And then taking an MVP approach that we talked about, right? Get something out, get it started, get people using it, and then iterate, get it, get it moving forward. And that same methodology applied to all the agility they needed with their external, you know, external threats from companies that were trying to take, over the, take them over the market. Um, this one's pretty critical, because you'll, you'll find um, in, in a lot of organizations we've seen, there's always one or two people that want to do this, and they're really excited by it, and there's a bunch of people that are just they're ter either terrified or don't want to do it, they don't like change, whatever that is. So you need to find the champions inside the organizations that want to do this and tell everyone else how great it was. So you pick one or two people and we walk through, you know, as, we, as we talk to the different development teams, it became very clear to us you know, who was ready for this and who wasn't and who was really excited by it. And you take the really excited people and get them to lead the, lead the charge and they really make a big difference in terms of the way this adopts through your organization. And then the SOA enablement, right? It, this is really, again, and I think I've said this a bunch of times, build services, not applications, so that you're not duplicating things as, as you go through. And then measure the key performance indicators that we talked about, right? That you need to have those metrics when you're done. So to do this, it's actually a different organization than they had today. You know, when, when, when we step through this, the, the idea here, the program manager sort of runs the overall PaaS program for this business. There were uh, five major areas that reported up to that. In this case, it's policy, KPI tracking, communications, and the PaaS architect. Different organizations, those are going to be different. This is sort of the way this organization was laid out. And those people are really driving the, the, the overall PaaS platform. There's product managers and project managers. 
Product managers would grow over time as the platform got bigger. They'd handle different areas. They'd be over time, you'd have a, a data-centric product manager, um, service-centric project managers, and so on. You can grow that out. And project managers to make sure everyone is sort of going on. And below them, you'd have, a, you'd have PaaS engineers and scrum masters to really make sure that, that you're moving through. Uh, the governance is also important, and Francesco talked about that, making sure the business is ready for it. Those would create working groups that would involve security, program, other groups in the organization would fit in here when they needed to bring something into this group, would go through the governance body, would create a, a backlog, go into the project management group, and those would feed into a task team. The task team was actually multifunction. They came from different parts of the organization. They would feed into this group and build these tasks and, 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 and clear out the backlog in that fashion. There was also an exchange between operations and PaaS engineers. You know, I think we, we, I've seen this a lot with our customers. The operations guys are generally not, they're, 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 and a lot of times that's where I get a lot of, I see a lot of, most of the resistance, excuse me, from cloud and platform as a service. So getting those guys to work with the PaaS team and have the PaaS team work with the ops team so everyone sort of understood stood what everyone else was doing really created this culture for them that would enable this DevOps. And then you'd always feed in external resources. There's always an SME somewhere that understands this particular product better. They could feed into this task team. Maybe it's an app owner, a business owner, or a third party in their case. They had external resources that needed to come into this environment. So what we're looking at here is sort of the, the timeline that we put together for them. This was you know, seven quarters to get this going. And you start with governance, right? You have to have that operating body. You have to have make, make sure people know what they're going to do. If you, you know, I was just having a conversation earlier. You don't do the architecture. You don't do the installation before you do the architecture, right? In this case, in terms of the business process, you have to have the governance in place. The tool chain, they had a, a lot of different tools running around the organization. Everyone was using, you know, a combination of Jenkins and everything else. Get that in order. Make sure everyone's using a, a similar platform so it all works together. Then you go out and you actually do a deployment. You put together a PaaS environment. And then what, what we put together for them was a series of workload onboarding, right? You start with those PaaS champions. They're working in the sandbox. They're actually building out sandbox services. And then as they add their services on, they're, they're getting to the point where the platform gets to a certain size and then you sort of have critical mass. And then you can build this self-service PaaS platform for people to, to come through. So, you know, this is, this is really the, I'm going to just put up uh, the boxes here. But, you know, the goal here, one of their major drivers was th this development-centric culture. They had offices around the country. They were building an office in Palo Alto in California, right, to get up and running, to make sure that they could actually hire the right people and get this developer-centric culture in place so that they could build applications that were modern, that would handle the loads that they need and, and give them the, the, the ability to innovate when needed. Right? And the, the, the past tenants that sort of are, you know, this is w when they're done, this is what we've got, a centrally managed platform. Again, invest in the platform, not in the, in, in the project, so that, so that it grows. And then the pres prescriptive framework that we talked about, and then shared services. So with that, we can open up the floor to questions. We have a few minutes left. Uh, yes. Sure. So the, the, the stack here was, uh, it was OpenStack and VMware underneath, and then it was uh, OpenShift on top, and working with cartridges, right? They would pull in different cartridges to make that work. So yeah, they, they were very open to the, the, the open source environments for sure. Okay. Which, which platform was it? You know, we went through an evaluation with them, and we were looking at, you know, Cloud Foundry from a couple different vendors, right? And and, o and OpenShift, and based on their relationship with Red Hat and everything they were doing, there was also a, they had a very specific J2EE requirement that OpenShift met very well for them and would, would help them sort of move a lot faster through this. So that was one of the other reasons they chose, chose the OpenShift platform. So from that perspective, we were building cartridges that would actually run in, in the OpenShift platform that would expose their legacy data into the cloud. Uh, they're also looking at potentially using Cassandra to, to cache data 
in the PaaS platform, so they didn't always have to reach out to the central Oracle database or to the mainframe sometimes, right? This is a big financial institution. So getting those services cloud ready is part of the foundation that you have to build to get these, to get these platforms successful. Um, we actually, we helped them with the strategy around developing the processes that they needed to put in place and also the architecture, the fundamental architecture that they needed to put in place on top of the OpenStack environment that they had. We work in both, right? We can go from the process down to the deployments, right? So we work across the spectrum. I think there's a question behind you, actually. Yeah. We don't have the measurements yet, but we're still working with them, so we're hoping to get that soon. Don't have the answer to that one yet, sorry. Yeah, so, but the before processes were measured in months. Correct. And they're trying to get to weeks, and if they get to weeks, that's a win for them, right? Exactly. Yes, in the back? Sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Maybe you can step up to a microphone? Sorry. Uh, the question was around what other case studies? Yeah, we can share those with you um, after the, the, the event if you'd like. Um, but specifically, you're talking about the case studies for the other workloads? Okay, yeah, we can, we can certainly share those with you afterwards. But one of them, the um, CAR Cloud case study, you can find on the OpenStack.org uh, website and download that. Yes? Sure. So the way we define the platform services were ones that were centrally developed by a core incubation team, so to speak. The published services were services that were written by the individual development teams that they wanted to allow other teams to actually use. So that's how we, it's basically, it, they're both common shared services, but the, the generation of those, the development of those services is really one is centralized and one is, is distributed. Okay, any more questions? Anyone else? Great. Thanks very much for attending. Thank you very much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it.